Um, just a quick housekeeping note, we will be recording this session, so we will have that available for you afterwards if you would like to view it again or if you would like to share it with any of your other fellow employees. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to type those into the question box on the panel on the right. And then what we'll do is after the presentation is over, we will go through those questions and get those asked and answered. Um, other than that, I think we're ready to get rolling here. And I do want to introduce uh, Billy Ray Faust with EDI, uh, High Jump True Commerce EDI. He's been in the supply chain industry for more than 15 years. Um, he's been with High Jump since 2008, so he is definitely uh, experienced in, in this product line and has held a couple different roles in sales, business development, and channel sales development. He understands EDI extensively, and I can't put you in better hands. So with that, Billy Ray, it's all yours. Sounds fantastic. Thanks for the handoff, Ginger. Um, again, my name is Billy Ray with uh, True Commerce, part of the High Jump EDI. Uh, True Commerce EDI, part of the High Jump Software Company. And uh, let's go ahead and get started here today. So what we're going to be talking about is basically getting products to store shelves. Um, and one of the things I do want to sort of iterate from the beginning here is that we're going to be focusing on EDI sort of from a retail store shelf perspective for the simple fact that while EDI can work for a ton of different industries and do a ton of different things, uh, we all go shopping every day or at least every week or whenever we need to go to get food at the very bare minimum. So it's a very easy way to kind of go into the nuts and bolts of this, but also gives everybody sort of a reference point of something that we see in front of us every day. So. Uh, bear in mind that while a lot of this will seem store-centric, don't think that that is by any means indicative of a limitation of EDI and what industries it can serve. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the agenda. Uh, the first thing we'll do is have an introduction to High Jump software. Uh, some of you have, uh, may be aware we've had some, some growth in mergers recently. Uh, then we'll step into sort of what is EDI, why it might be something that's being required of you. Um, and then preparing for EDI. Uh, one of the things you'll want to take into consideration is that EDI has ex external to a technological requirement. There's also a lot of business relationships that EDI uh, can alter uh, as you bring on new customers requiring EDI. Uh, we'll look at what some of the benefits of EDI uh, are, both from, let's say, a customer's perspective, why they want you to do EDI, but then also as a supplier, what are the benefits of complying with your customer's EDI needs? And then we'll take a look at the actual true commerce solution and how we address EDI and why that is a good fit for you. And then we'll go ahead and open that up to discussion. So the first part is, is that uh, if we look at High Jump uh, in its entirety, we're a global provider of supply chain management solutions. Uh, so what we're really doing is taking inventory and information and moving it from suppliers to customers. Um, one of the things that I have on here is uh, that we've recently merged with the Cellos. And while that might not be big news to a lot of folks, it was big news for us. Uh, Cellos also is in the supply chain management uh, field. And what it did is it really allowed us to round out our portfolio uh, to manage customers of all sizes. Uh, it brought our global presence up to 12,000 customers, and our headquarters will remain in Bloomington, Minnesota. So again, High Jump has three different components. Uh, if we were to look at it, it would be the supply chain side, which is warehouse management. We also have direct store distribution, which we call DSD, and then the EDI group, which is what I am part of. And that brings us to the True Commerce EDI solutions. Uh, we actually became part of High Jump a number of years ago. And what we do is we provide end-to-end -end integrated EDI solutions. Uh, I'll go into what that end-to-end -end means, but it's really a more of a managed service so that you don't require an IT department to do EDI as much as you require an end user. Uh, we're the only EDI endorsed solution by Sage, so we are the exclusively endorsed partner for Sage products. Uh, and I'll go into the list of those products uh, in a moment here. And we've achieved the highest levels of partnerships with leading ERP providers. Right now, we support over 3,500 trading partner maps, which are essentially you can think of as customers. And we'll go into a little more detail on what those are for nearly 4,000 of our own true commerce customers. So roughly one-third of high jump software customers are true commerce customers. 
Uh, we support all your ongoing mapping updates, provided at no charge. And again, I'll get into what that means a little more. And this number actually, it's over 100,000 transactions daily. That's actually getting close to about 125,000 transactions completed daily, and that is seven days a week that we run. Uh, and we have EDI, our primary offices are in seven fields, which is just north of Pittsburgh, and then rest in Virginia, which is just west of Washington, D.C. Uh, so we've been really growing at a very steady clip during a challenging time for a lot of folks in the software segment. Excellent. So moving on, uh, what we're going to look at next is the benefits of the SAGE endorsement. Uh, I was here a number of years ago when we entered into this agreement with SAGE. And what it essentially does is when you're ordering a SAGE uh, EDI, True Commerce product, whether it be for SAGE 50, the US edition, 100, 300, 500, all of those products are actually sold through SAGE. So they are the exclusively endorsed SAGE uh, products. And then when SAGE X3, that's a newer product for SAGE um, in the relative, in the distribution and the channel. Um, and so that's uh, something that we're now launching a sort of a new partnership on. Uh, without going into the nuts and bolts, just know that, you know, again, we are a preferred partner for SAGE for that, and we work with them on development. And the real advantage being there that we have patch deployments ready, uh, which are fairly um, frequent for SAGE X3. We have those ready in conjunction with SAGE. And then we're also supporting some of their legacy systems, SAGE Pro and SAGE PFW, um, because those are no longer um, uh, offered in the same way as the 100 and 300 and 500 packages. It is a little bit of a different order process. But again, we are the preferred provider for them. Um, going back into sort of our nuts and bolts of this, um, we do have a rigorous testing with SAGE. Um, and we do independent testing. And we work in conjunction with them. And so the important thing for an end user is to know that our product updates to correspondingly match a version update for a SAGE product are typically ready for deployment within 30 days of release of the general release of that product. We work in advance with it. Typically, we will hold it back for up to 30 days. Customers can uh, ask to do it earlier. But when they do a general release, they like to have it 30 days out in the wild before we start to make those upgrades, just in case there's anything that they have to go back on. And again, it is an end-to-end -end solution, which means you're going to have one point of contact for your EDI software your communications via a van, your mapping, and then your additional plug-in modules. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, and we'll get into what this means, your mapping and migration updates are provided at no cost. Um, on the migration cost, this is a big one. If you're doing a version update to your ERP, we will provide the corresponding EBI update for that at no additional cost. Uh, it's a flat rate for our trading partner mappings. Uh, so whether you have a very intricate partner or a very straightforward partner, it's always the same cost. And whether it's a new or one of our existing mappings, there's the same cost for that. And we have a dedicated group uh, focused on trading partner maps and updates. Uh, this is really important because we're actually working with the trading partners in the event that the trading partner has an outage, uh, a problem on their end, we're able to communicate that to you so that you're not kind of sitting there going, I don't understand why this isn't processing. You know, periodically trading partners do have interruptions in their service, and we're able to work with them directly to help them help you. Uh, additionally, we manage the updates that they deploy for you. And then finally, again, uh, we have affordable migration paths. Uh, so if you're moving from one, say, GRP solution to another, um, or uh, one of the other products that we do support, um, is a very affordable transition. And what I mean by that is the core components, as I break it down for you, will stay the same from ERP to ERP. So there is no wasted product with us. Uh, when you make conversions, a lot of your product and a lot of your database historical data is going to move over to that new system um, with a cheap, uh, very affordable uh, migration. So taking a step back from all of that, you know, one of the folks uh, will ask, well, OK, I signed up for this. What exactly is EDI? So for those of you that haven't really been exposed to EDI before, it's really just a common language 
for different companies' computer systems to talk to one another. Um, and so essentially what's going to happen is uh, your customer can be running on one business system or ERP system, and you and every other supplier can be running on a completely different system. EDI is basically a bridge language that allows those two very different systems to communicate directly with each other. It's a little bit archaic in its raw format, which is in the back here, uh, but it really gets the job done. It's an older technology, dates back to the railroads in the 1960s, when really you know, supercomputers, which probably would fit on today's handheld, uh, were a relatively new thing. And because the railroads and transportation were the early adopters, it went to heavy core industry. And from those transportation systems really began to be got adopted by warehouses and retailers. Uh, so it's a very entrenched and established technology. It's not something that's kind of here today, gone tomorrow. If you're investing in EDI, it's going to be something you're going to use over the long haul. It's not going to be replaced by anything tomorrow or really any time in the distant future. It's, it's pretty stable. Um, one of the reasons that EDI got a lot more prevalent, um, even starting as you know, we had some economic difficulties in the United States in 2008, is evolving market demands. Uh, one of the things is, is that EDI is a cost-efficient saver for customers, uh, and it can be for suppliers too. So as people wanted to eke out better margins or better returns, EDI became something that they turned to more and more frequently. Now the second part is it's just business growth. You know, as we've seen the economy rebound, um, customers want to make sure they're putting their new suppliers on there. So as a company that is looking to do business with these customers, understand that as you're growing your business, you're likely to run into EDI requirements with your customers. And the other part is that really exploded is some new business trends, and that's really the e-commerce explosion. So every time you're buying something off of, say, an Amazon.com or any stores, like a brick and mortar store is their web store version, a Target.com, a Walmart, behind every one of those transactions is actually a series of EDI transactions instructing the supplier of who, where, why, when, and how to ship that product. Uh, the other part is the drop ship frequency. And we can look at that from a traditional dropship model, which could be something like heavy industry, like stone, for example, where a quarry is actually shipping it out, or a cement manufacturer. But also, you can have that in the case of what people call dropship, which is a bit of a newer innovation, which is the web stores. But also, let's say you were to go into a department store, or really where this really occurs a lot, is a home furnishings or a large item or um, any of the home, um, think of the Home Depots and the Lowe's. There's a lot of products there that they do not store locally or they have some level of customization. You are actually ordering and paying for that at the store, but then it's being shipped either to the store or directly to you. And all of those transactions are being again, sent back and forth in an EDI format. So it could be the delivery to your door of a new bed, or it could be the arrival at the store of a personalized mailbox. All of those are going to have an EDI transaction behind them. Also, the time to market increase. Uh, one of the last things about that is, you know, customers want to run lean inventories in warehouses. So they want to have just-in-time delivery. EDI basically enables them through the routing and scheduling to know when items need reordered from their ERP system, communicate that over to suppliers, and also get an accurate supply chain management of when those items are going to show up at the warehouse. What is their time to delivery? And then finally, really just the prevalence in the small business uh, space. Uh, with growing companies, EDI becomes something new that you have to do. But also, there's been a lot of advances where data can be taken from point of sale systems to provide a supplier with a better picture of how their products are selling and where, and also strengthening the transportation and logistics processes. Uh, all of your big, big freight carriers and your warehouses, they're running EDI. So, you know, all of that being said, what does that mean to the average person? Well, this is where EDI lives. Basically, every major grocery chain, whether it's a small regional outfit or a big national chain, um, it's running EDI. So almost 
everything that ends up on a shelf in a grocery store got there via EDI. So it's just right there a big impact. I mean, every time you're going to the store and you buy a box of cereal, it got there via EDI. The same thing with all of your major retailers, and again, also your your more regional outfits, they're running EDI. So when you go and you buy a you know a set of garbage bags off of the shelf at a home store, um, that got there via EDI. When you go in and you buy you know the latest uh, greatest holiday toy of the year, it got there via EDI. And also when you think about something uh, that might be a hot commodity going into the holiday season, the inventory levels are being communicated over EDI to try to get good fill rates for the customers or the delivery of someone ordering something for a relative or a friend. Uh, that's also being tracked and managed via EDI. Which, talking about that last example, that's where these third-party logistics firms come in. So your trucking companies, your warehouses, your freight forwarders, all of those are running EDI. So it really is tying together the entire distribution market for retail, grocery, but again, a lot of other uh, industries run EDI. Petroleum runs EDI. The utilities run EDI. Um, HR companies run EDI. So it's not limited to just what I'm showing you here. It's just this is what you see around you every day. So one of the things we talk about is when you're required with a new customer to do EDI, it's called a mandate. Um, and essentially what they're saying is you need to do EDI to get orders from us. So what does that really mean? Well, occasionally they may give you a short exemption. Let's say you've never done business with the company. They might allow you on a temporary test basis to put your product on their market. But most of the times, they really want you to be EDI compliant from day one. They're going to pick suppliers that already support EDI. A lot of times when you're filling out information to become a supplier for those customers, they will ask you not only if you're EDI compliant, but what is your EDI routing number? Who is your EDI provider? Um, in the past, this caused some problems because they would say, are you EDI compliant? Someone would check off the box, even though they had never heard of what EDI is. They get their first order, and it comes over EDI, and they have no way to get it. So now companies do vet the suppliers a little better because they want to know that they truly have EDI in place. And they're also going to pick suppliers that have EDI in place. They don't want to have to go through the teething pains. Now, that being said, if you provide a product that they want, they will work with you, and that's where we really come in is helping you understand what are the EDI requirements. And that's what your customer really wants, is the ability to issue purchase orders seamlessly to all their suppliers, get all their invoices back from all their suppliers in the exact same format. The same thing goes with their shipping documents. So when you think of a big retailer who may have tens of thousands of different suppliers, what they really want is a uniform method for issuing purchase orders and receiving invoices back in. And that's why they're being asking you to do this so that their system, if you had them getting faxes and you know verbally committed orders and some on EDI, it would be a mess for them. They really need a consistent system. And again, why now? Well, a lot of times this has been in the process. You may be new to EDI. But again, as people look for cost improvements in their system, they'll look at EDI as another method to help achieve that cost efficiency. How this affects you and your work process, we're going to delve into a little deeper here. So let's just take a look at what EDI can accomplish, right? And here's kind of an expanded map of some of the things that EDI does. So for example, this home store is sending a purchase order known as an 850 to their suppliers. That supplier can then send back a series of documents. They might send back a purchase order acknowledgment that's called an 855, tells them what's available, anything that's out of stock if there's a delay in that product or if it's been delisted. That company then, the supplier, will send that over to the customer. The customer may go with their existing 850 if these line up, but if there are changes, maybe they'll issue a change order. It's an 860. It's the same thing as a purchase order, but amending the original. Now, when those orders get boxed and packaged and ready to go, the customer is going to receive from the supplier what's called an EDI 856. And you really don't have to worry about learning these numbers. 
but it's called an advanced ship notice. And really what it's doing is saying what they're shipping, when they're shipping, how they're shipping it, and how those products are packed so that the customer know when, knows what they'll be receiving, when they'll be receiving it, and how to process that. Additionally, the supplier can then send over the EDI 810 in invoice and then receive back an 820 bank remittance notice telling them of what's been paid. And each time one of these transactions is going back and forth, a little document's being created called a 997. And really all that is is like an email read receipt or a fax confirmation. It basically tells you, whether you're the customer or the supplier, that your partner successfully received that document, that the communication was successful. If we want to take a step further out, a lot of companies have begun to engage third-party logistics firms and third-party warehouses. You know, it does become a very simple process when one looks at expanding their business. Uh, a lot of times they want to not build a whole new facility or take over a facility. Uh, they're going to use a 3PL. Or perhaps they want to get a better economy by having a East Coast headquarters and a West Coast distribution facility or the vice versa. They may be looking to use these 3PLs to cut down on the next set of documents here, transportation costs. So what will happen is a supplier can send over a series of documents. We call it the 900 series, basically telling them what orders to fulfill for this customer. And how they're going to fulfill it is a series of tenders and invoices going back from freight companies. So that warehouse will use their established trucking companies to send out a tender to get a cost for the load, and then invoice that out. So it entirely covers the supply chain all the way to their door. And they're getting notifications from the trucking company that are coming back that are saying, this product is at this destination and will arrive at this time. And then here's a bill for the freight. All that information is then consolidated by the warehouse and sent back to the supplier that completes their order process saying, we ship this item via this carrier with this freight. So it's a nice way to really tie up the entire solution or the entire uh, supply chain on one consistent format. Now there are a couple of different types of EDI solutions um, and these can be a little bit confusing which is why I was going to address them. Now the first is, is something known as a service bureau. These are actually the original EDI providers and they're fairly obscure now. Almost think of them as a Western Union, right? Um, or a data processing house where they're actually keying and sending orders for you. Um, they're, again, very rare at this point. And they would be something like you're sending a telegram, right? You might only get one order or a couple orders. So a service bureau is fairly obscure at this point. The next would be a trading partner portal. Now, one of the things about a trading partner portal is that is actually maintained by the customer. So each individual customer will have a different trading partner. And typically, these trading partner portals are offered as a short-term or interim solution. Uh, they're typically not true EDI because they're maintained exclusively by the customer. And what you're doing is logging in and viewing an order and then rekeying your invoicing and shipping information. Again, that is proprietary to the customer, so you would have to maintain one for each different customer that you supply. But most importantly, they don't allow the import and export of data. You're really just viewing it and then rekeying your data, which leads to one of the limitations of a trading partner portal is that because you're hand keying, a lot of data mistakes happen. So a trading partner portal is limited to typically a new vendor or someone with a low volume. Uh, once you typically cross a volume threshold because manual keying errors will happen, the customer is responsible for correcting them in the back end, uh, there will be a limitation whether it be time or volume that you can use the trading partner portal. And that's going to bring us into what we really know as today's EDI solutions. The first is a compliant solution. It is a true EDI solution. You're actually sending back and forth EDI. In this case, we'll talk about X12 documents. And you can put all of your customers on one compliant solution. So you are basically tying together multiple different customers through one source. 
However, with a compliant solution, all it is doing is putting EDI in the proper format. There is no integration. It does not touch your ERP. You're once again printing and hand entering information into the compliance solution. And that's going to lead me to our last version, which is what most people prefer, which is an EDI integrated solution with your ERP software. So whether you are running a Sage system or perhaps a NetSuite system, what we're going to do with one of those integrated solutions is we're going to take the purchase order directly from the customer and via routine import it into your ERP system and create your sales order entry. Additionally, that's going to allow us to export invoices out directly from your ERP and your shipping information. The real advantage with this is because we're working with the customer's data that we're bringing in, you don't have to worry about miskeying the information they're sending to you. Additionally, because the invoice is going back to match against their document, you're going to be sending them correct information. Now, one of the other things about an integrated solution that I'm going to get into here is also validating the data that you're receiving against the data that you have inside your ERP system. So we want to make sure that lines up. Now, I'm just going to go over these are a couple commonly used terms, and we'll kind of just blow through this. But if you see any of these terms here, and you're uncertain as to whether you need EDI, uh, these are kind of the dead giveaways. ANSI X12 is the North American standard for EDI. Trading partners we've sort of discussed. In this, we're talking about them as a customer. But they could actually be internal partners of the same company, different divisions. It's any two people sending the data back and forth. A killer character, it's really just a measure of a unit of data. And an implementation guide is something we don't want you to have to worry about. That's telling you how you have to set up the EDI relationship. And the transaction set, those are those numbers that correspond with the purchase order and the invoice that I discussed. And then finally, the GS128 or the UCC128 labels, those are shipping labels that go on outer cartons that reference EDI shipping documents. When they're scanned with a barcoded reader, they tell the inbound customer when they're creating a receipt of goods, not only what is in the boxes, but how the inner cartons are packed, referencing the original document. And then another term, VAN, it's really just a value-added network. It's how you're sending your EDI data back and forth. And a couple of the most common documents that we already reviewed, the purchase order, the acknowledgment, the shipping notice, the invoice. And again, on the right-hand side, you see what the raw EDI data looks like. Uh, what we're essentially doing with our solution is turning that into a usable format for you. That's really what the mapping is, is taking a look at this data here on the right-hand side and putting it either into a human-readable form or a form that is acceptable into your ERP system. So again, a little of this is, is going over ground we've covered. Why do they want to do this? But as you saw in that diagram, it's just a faster time to market. It's more accurate information. It's getting better stock inventory. It's getting better information. It's greater accuracy and efficiency. And then obviously driving bottlenecks out of uh, distribution. And then if we look at like the web stores, it's enhancing the end user's customer experience. They're advertising something and sending that information directly to the supplier who's sending it to you. And then again, finally, it gives you end-to-end -end visibility for all partners. How does it help you as a supplier that's engaging EDI? Well, you know, the first part is, is you always have to think about this is you're doing it for one of two reasons, either to acquire a new customer or retain a customer that you already have. You're really kind of matching what they need to continue doing business. Now, there are some benefits as a supplier. Typically, you can see some increased margins whether it's through reducing manual entry data with an integrated solution, streamlining your order processing. There are automation tools that allow you to run these programs 24-7. And then, you know, what a lot of us have already gotten past, but if you still, you know, have these things, you're basically driving out some of the day-to-day -day costs of papers, printers, ink. Two of the most important parts, though, it improves your turnaround time. Because you're sending their approved format on the invoice, you're going to get paid quicker and improves business relationships. But again, most importantly, it makes your business more attractive to larger customers. 
as I met at the very, uh, mentioned at the very beginning, they don't really ask if you're EDI compliant or if you would get EDI. They want to know that you have EDI. So some customers or suppliers will proactively, even if they have not taken on an EDI relationship, at least get an EDI routing number and an account set up for receiving data. So why EDI? And so what are some of the risks and errors and basically inaccuracies? And this is a little bit tied into the integration component, right? What we do with our software is you want to know the order quantity. You know, what does one mean? Is it an each, a master pack, a case lot? Is it 12 to a carton? Is it a skid? And that can be different between customers, right? So one customer might want to order cases and specify 12 eaches. Another customer orders a case and just sends over a one. What the software is going to do with integration is we build tables so that before, let's say, you're going to bring something into your Stage 100 system, we're building item aliases so that you can store things. And if we ship down here, the clarity of your ID. So you may use a stock keeping SKU. They assign it a UPC number or their own stock keeping unit. What we're allowed to, able to do for you is check that item against what exists in your Sage system or NetSuite system before you even bring the document into your system. So you're checking for valid items. The other thing is, is you're going to have your price lookups in there. So what we'll be able to do is verify that they're sending over the correct price for that item. And then depending upon your business relationship with that customer, we'll process that in a number of different ways, depending, again, on your relationship where you do have a price discrepancy. Um, in the expedition of time, you would just look at a number of different ways that are most preferable uh, to your business relationship. It's less of a technological issue than it is being consistent with your customer when they send you over incorrect pricing or perhaps something that's no longer being issued for sale or something that has changed in pricing. But again, you'll be able to grab that information and as it is being processed through, have that flagged out or make changes. So we can discuss that in a little greater detail uh, in a few steps here. And then the final thing is, is maintaining the ship to codes. Uh, a lot of times customers are not going to pass over an address on every order. They're going to pass over a ship to code. One of the advantages is we manage everything at the customer level so your ship to codes can be stored so that when you go to process an order, it will reference that ship to code to a business address that you've previously stored in your ERP system. Let's take a look at this in a little bit greater detail and why it's important. Uh, one of the things about EDI is when you send incorrect information, it has cost implications and it can trigger what we call chargebacks. If I drop to the bottom one, errors in communication, size and weight challenges, and you see that picture of the truck there, right? Well, if you send them the wrong information as to what's being sent, you might get the wrong where, warehouse, the, uh, the wrong size truck might blow up, right? Or the truck did not uh, think to accommodate your space because you sent them incorrect information. Well, the trucking line is going to charge the 3PL who's going to charge you. Or if the quantities aren't correct, or the size isn't correct in the dimensions of the weight, well, you can be off at the warehouse level, which means you incorrectly calculated your invoice for the freight you're going to get a financial penalty there. And then most importantly, if you're not sending the customer the specific and exact quantities, uh, you're going to get a charge back there. Or if the format is not correct, they'll charge you back there. So what our solution is looking to do, and we talk about mapping, is the mapping specifies all the formats that they need populated and how they need to receive that data in the proper format and that's going to alleviate, if not remove, your chargebacks. Um, that's something we strive very hard for, is to make sure that you know, we can take everything out of it from an EDI standpoint of it and make sure that that is correct. And then it just becomes the human process of packing boxes, labeling boxes, and putting boxes on the truck. We want the technology to always be right and specific for you. Again, the two terms I will use a bit redundancy, redundantly is accuracy and efficiency. We want you to be able to process them quickly and efficiently, but also accurately. That's why we're tying into the ERP system 
to make sure that we've got the exact data and through integration we're taking the customer's exact data that they're sending you. And then the last part is, is you don't want to miss shift dates. So one of the things I mentioned is, is that these EDI programs can be run in an automated fashion. So you can receive things overnight, but also you can respond to these 855s or product order acknowledgments and tell them exactly what's available at what time. And if you see that there's a canceled date, that you can work with your customer on that uh, if something is out of stock or not likely to be in there. When you have missed shift dates and you say you can fulfill something by this date, and you don't, you know, the customer becomes risk averse. If there are two identical products, they will lead to the one that has had a more consistent ship date uh, or more consistent information on the status of their products. So that's actually a very important function of EDI. I mentioned earlier we're a managed network, and you saw the term VAN come up. What does that really mean? Well, you know, across all these different thousands of customers, they support direct uh, different connections. So some might run a direct AS2, some may run an FTP connection, some use what we call interconnecting VANs, and then some, uh, especially in the fulfillment of uh, online orders, will use Commerce Hub. Now we at True Commerce support all of these formats, and these are just a sampling and a sampling of customers. As an end user, you don't have to worry about any of this. This is all managed behind the scenes, and we maintain it in the format that your customer requires, and we will change to match any requirements they make changes for at no cost for you. Additionally, if we need to validate your AS2 certificate annually, we do that for you. And if they do an interconnect switch with a van with an additional fee, you don't have to worry about paying for that. That is part of your service with us. So again, we can support any connection type required with your North American trading partners. So let's go ahead and really dig into the solution itself. Uh, these are the components that we're looking at. So on the one hand, we have the one thing over here that's familiar, which would be, let's say, a Sage ERP system. Or again, Blyco does support, and we support also as a suite app developer, NetSuite. Uh, what we're doing is we're putting everything under one roof. And Yes, it is graphically a cloud. You can put this up in the cloud. There is no additional cost. There is no difference uh, in the functionality of the software. So if you want to do it in the cloud, that's perfectly fine. We support that. Uh, or if you would like, you can also use an on-premises solution. Again, they're identical solutions. There is no price difference. There is no functionality difference um, of any real mention between the two products. What is important, and I'm going to move forward to another slide, is that we're managing all of that for you, and I'll show you that in a little greater graphic interpretation. What I do want you to take away from this is that there's three main components to any uh, EDI solution. Your integration component, which is what's going into an out of your ERP. Your transaction manager is the name of our brand, but essentially that's your mailbox, right? That's where mail is coming in, and that's where we're actually translating the EDI data. As you saw in some of the earlier slide, it's a bit archaic and you know you can't just, unless you've done it for far too long, look at a raw EDI data and know what's inside of it. It needs to be converted into a usable solution for you, whether that's just a human readable version or whether we're prepping it for the integration. And then referencing the slide from just before, the network. In our case, it's the True Commerce network, and that's how we're sending the data back and forth with all of your different customers. And again, the nice part is, as you add new customers, and I'll show you this on another slide, all of this is remaining constant. Some of the, the add-ons that we do have for the product are a scheduler that allows you to automate your routines. So if you want to run a nightly batch of invoices at 5 p.m. every day, it'll do that. But also, the scheduler can go out and look for inbound data when you're not even at the office. So let's say, for example, you're whether East or West Coast time, there's a three-hour difference, you can still be receiving and generating a response to your customers even when you're completely closed. Uh, we also offer a shipping module solution, and what that really does is it's taking data from your shipping carrier, a tracking number, for example, and then writing that back into your EDI document. Uh, so you're accurately doing that, and you're skipping a step of keying some 
you know, fairly long numbers in. The packing list solution, that's actually fairly exclusive to your web stores. And what they want to see is the document that you're sending to the customer, essentially the label that's going in the box or the packing list that goes in the box, be in their format with their logo. And that is supported with our solution. And then we're also looking, as you can see to the right here, I mentioned earlier the GS128 or UCC128 uh, shipping labels. Those are supported too. Uh, a couple other things, you can run concurrent users. They can be at different locations. And you can set it up so that the different permissions of your users are differently, so that the warehouse doesn't log into your financials module. Uh, and also that you can have people from remote sites logging in and having visibility. And again, we can do a multiple company support. So if you do have multiple systems, companies set up inside of your ERP, without a problem, we can support that. But also there is a case where sometimes your customer may want to see you as two different companies, and we can support that for you. Um, a couple of the benefits that we offer. Uh, the first is that we have dedicated support and deployment teams. Uh, they're broken down along what we call business system lines. So if you're a Sage 100 user, uh, our support and deployment teams are trained on Sage 100. That'll be both during your deployment and your support. So you don't have to worry about you know somebody that's working with you learning your ERP from scratch. The other part is free technical and implementation support. That's both as a new customer and an ongoing customer. The point I make is don't hesitate to pick up the phone. Uh, we are ba based stateside for all of our support questions. So you can pick up the phone and just give us a ring. Or you know sometimes people would just send an email to support for a non-urgent issue. Again, there's no cost on that. The meter is not running. There's no fee for annual software maintenance. So you know once a year, a lot of other add-on products, you've got to send them a 15, 20, 25 percent of the original purchase price. Uh, for maintenance, there is no maintenance cost with our software, and there's no annual network or termination fee on the network. One of the other things is, is there are variable network plans. So if you have a high degree of seasonality, you can move between network plans month to month without any charge and adjust those. And you can view your network usage inside of our customer center. And again, the trading partner maps are upgraded at no fee. Uh, we do have a trading partner team that's getting the maps and another one that's deploying the maps, working with the trading partners, and also helping you resolve issues with the trading partners. Uh, sometimes these things go a little bit outside of EDI. We help you work with them to understand what they're really saying if they're not really effectively communicating that. And these mapping updates do happen depending on the customer, anywhere from every three to six to nine to 12 months. Really just you know is one of those things that depends on the customer. And again, there's no hidden fee. So what you're going to have is a flat software cost and the flat network cost. So if you're moving forward with EDI um, or preparing or really just investigating it, these are some of the key things you're going to want to look at. Uh, the volume um, of a business that you're doing with that customer, right? Uh, maybe if you're only sending one or two orders, well, maybe just a compliance solution might be a good fit for you. If you don't know if you're going to be doing business with the long range, you can look at that route. Because as I mentioned earlier, there's no wasted software with the product. It's not if you buy something and then upgrade something, you're starting from scratch. We leverage your customer modules. And also the frequency with which you ship. You want to see you know, how much exposure you have to miskeying of information. Also evaluate your familiar with EDI. Uh, what does that mean? You may be running a solution now that's not exactly what's optimal for you, but you understand it. Uh, you might be brand new to EDI. You just kind of want to let us or Blythco know that information kind of at the outset so that we work with you so we're not you know, talking in a million miles an hour when we're really getting the ball started. But then again, you know, if you're saying, I have 12 EDI partners, these are my documents that I'm processing, Here's my information. We're not, you know, saying, "Hey, welcome to EDI." Also, you know, take a look at their list of retailers you're selling to now. But also, this is very important. You know, I'm in sales. Salespeople are always kind of looking at that next thing. Get an eye to the retailers you have on your horizon. 
Maybe there's somebody that doesn't require EDI now, but they may in the future. Or also maybe your sales reps are going after that big key national account. You want to make sure you're ready to roll out your EDI for them after you do all that hard work of selling into it and getting that product price placement. You don't want to stumble because you weren't prepared for EDI. And then these other ones will work with you. Identify the core transaction sets that are going to be required and mandated. It's going to affect your business process. And then what are the plans for EDI integration to the, the ERP system? The other ones, the big one here is what's the time frame for implementing EDI? We can save people at the last minute. We do all the time, but it's not the way you want to go about things. Let us know the date that you need EDI for. They'll have a mandate or a deadline date. If you're a new customer, that might be the date that they're going to start sending you live orders by or you have to have testing by to meet their contract. If you're an existing supplier and you're implementing EDI for the first time, they may give you a deadline date that says if you're not EDI compliant by this date, we will no longer be issuing you purchase orders. These are the really big ones you want everybody to know about up front. And uh, that's actually going to conclude the presentation. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we do integration for the SAGE systems, also for NetSuite. Uh, we have a great working relationship with Blythco. We have over 65 shared customers between us. Um, so we are always on the phone together, whether it be with our support teams, our sales teams. You know, that's the advantage is you can just pick up the phone when you have a question, and you know, it's always going to be a gate addressed for you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up to questions. Well, thank you, Billy Ray. That was great, very informational. Um, as I said at the beginning, if you do have a question, feel free to type it into the question panel, and then we can read those aloud and get those answered. Um, so that's definitely something we can help you with if you do have anything you're curious about. <clears throat> Let's see. OK, I do have one here. Um, is there a limit to how many trading partners we can add? No, that's uh, unlimited. We have folks that have one trading partner. We have some that are approaching 100 trading partners. Uh, oh, wow. No limitation on that. And one of the things I did mean to mention earlier, and I'm just going to use the example of Sage 100. Uh, one of the things that we do is inside of our software, we manage everything at the trading partner level or your customer. The reason that we do that is your customers have a wide variety of different formats, but you're still one running one ERP, in this case, Sage 100. Uh, what we're doing is, is we do create via a custom office file uh, some unique tabs in Sage 100. And it would be different the process that we deploy this, but it's the same across all Sage offerings. An additional tab inside of the original sales order entry that's going to be the true commerce tab. And what we're going to do is we're going to store information there that does not have a natural home inside the ERP. So for example, a ship to code could be stored on those fields or a tracking number. And the reason I, I bring this up and tie it to trading partner is when we deploy the solution, you could have two different customers. And one customer requires a tracking number on the invoice. The other customer does not. When we take that data from the transaction manager, our software, and bring it into Sage 100, we will have set it up so that Sage, your Sage customer profile, now knows which ones require the tracking number and which ones do not, so that when you're processing your invoice through, it makes sure that that field is populated so you send the proper information back to your customer. Thank you. Um, Vivian has a question. How do you work with Commerce Hub? OK, so Commerce Hub, we are a highly recommended partner of theirs. Uh, you would still work with Commerce Hub. Uh, Commerce Hub essentially is processing on behalf of the retailer. They're taking their data in. Now, you can directly pick up your Commerce Hub information from them. But when you do that, that's a little bit of a line along the lines of the trading partner portal that I discussed. 
what we're doing is taking that over the next step to allow for either a, a unified compliance solution for all your commerce hub uh, retailers sending and receiving in an EDI format but most advantageously especially if you have a high volume with them we're now integrating that data into the SAGE system. So what we would do is Commerce Hub would hand that data off to us. We will take that data across the True Commerce network and then bring those sales order entries into your ERP system. So essentially Commerce Hub is communicating information over to us directly, which we then can integrate into your system. Uh, we have a wide variety of customers and systems and when customers need integration, Commerce Hub actually does have a referral program to us, so we're very familiar with them. Uh, and that includes not just deploying the solution, but maintaining the solution and troubleshooting with them. Great. Uh, any other questions? Feel free to type them in. Um, here's another one. Uh, how long does it typically take to get up and running with EDI? Okay, so um, this is a, a very good question. Uh, number one, there is going to be a, a, a very wide delta. Let's say you have an emergency. We don't like to advertise this. Sometimes we can get you set up so that you have the bare minimum connection point with your trading partner in a couple days, right? All we're doing is just getting you set up for testing so that they don't shut you off and say you're out. So, you know, that's why I mentioned that whole kind of drop dead date. So if you're scrambling and you just need to get your mailbox set up and get your testing started with them, we can do that in a couple of days for you typically. Now, a real EDI project is typically about an eight week project. Now that's going to be a little more or a little less depending on the number of trading partners. But what you have to think about is we're setting up a lot of data and what we typically want to do is set that up first with the EDI integration to the ERP because we want to create a test environment. And what we want to do is test the data into and out of SAGE. We want to go through those item lookup tables, the price verification, the ship to codes. We want to pass that data back and forth out of SAGE before we do the next step, which is testing back and forth with the trading partner. Now, a lot of times, folks that are in that situation already have their trading partner relationship set up. We're cutting over the trading partner relationship to the True Commerce Network. All we're really adding is the integration. We can, depending on the number of customers, again, cut a couple more weeks off of there. So yeah, minimum, I always say plan for four weeks at the bare minimum for your integration setup. Eight weeks is kind of on the longer, more uh, documents being supported range. And also we can do, you know, uh, multiple trading partner setups and testing with the trading partners. So let's say you had four customers, it might be six weeks, maybe four weeks. If you have 20, it might be eight. But if you have 50, it might only be nine or 10, right? So we can do big blocks of them. But we do generally say, you know, allow for eight weeks uh, simply because if we're doing new testing with the trading partner or if they do require any sort of a recertification, um, things move at their leisure sometimes. So we can send over the test data and we have to wait for them to send it back. Then we respond to it again. So I'd like to give you a more concrete, it takes this many man hours and this many weeks. Um, but just know that on the short side of an integration scale, we'll use Sage 100 as a benchmark. On the short side, four weeks. On the longer side, eight weeks. And then just depending on the number of trading partners and if the relationships are already in place anywhere in between there. Great. Thank you. Um, another question from Vivian. I know you actually are a high jump client. <laughs> um, is, it, is there a webinar for best practices on integration with Stage 100? We are upgrading from Math 203.71 to Stage 100. We'd like to learn more about automation. Um, Vivian, I'll make sure that uh, your account manager, Krista, reaches out to you and can coordinate with High Jump to discuss this question with you offline, um, because that may be something you want to have a, a more separate, more thorough conversation on. 
um, than what we can cover here. So I'll make sure that this gets addressed for you as soon as this event is over, okay? Um, Definitely. And the other? only thing yeah. Go ahead. I would add to that is what we can do is, you know, I am familiar with 371 and, uh, you know, some of the reasons that people have stayed on that version, custom programming perhaps, um, what we will do is be able to show you that there are some quantum leaps forward so we can address that with you and then what we'll do is set up to emulate, uh, let's say, a 4.4 or higher version because that's where you'll see the big difference. Great, thank you. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions, so I think that has taken care of the, the uh, topic for today. Again, Belly Ray, thank you. Very informational. And uh, just to let everybody know, I will send you a link to the recorded version of this so that you can review it or share it with other coworkers. And we thank you so much for spending time with us today. Everybody have a great rest of the day. All right. Thanks again for having me. Thanks, Billy Ray.